20. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Number 20. our blessed Redeemer, sing all earth, His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest archangels in glory, strength and honor give to His holy name. Like a shepherd, Jesus will guide His children in His arms, He carries them all day long. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. For our sins He suffered and bled and died. He our rock, our hope of eternal salvation. Hail Him, hail Him, Jesus the crucified. Sound His praises, Jesus who bore our sorrows. Love unbounded, wonderful, deep and strong. Praise Him, praise Him, tell of His excellent greatness. Praise Him, praise Him, ever in joyful song. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus, our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, loud with those and His ring. Jesus, Savior, reigneth forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious power and glory unto the lord belong praise him praise him praise him praise him ever in joyful song and number 44 to god be the glory number 44 things he hath done so loved he the world that he gave us his son who did his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in praise the lord praise the lord let the earth hear his voice praise the lord Praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. All come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. Pro perfect redemption, the purchase of blood to every believer, the promise of God, the vilest defender. Truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh God to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory things he hath done, great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son, but newer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, 
raise alarm, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. David, you may be seated. You may be seated. All right, let's do this. Uh, anybody got a birthday this week? We sure would love to sing to you. Anybody got a birthday this week? No birthdays. Okay, how about an anniversary? Anybody got an anniversary? This week. Well, that's boring. All right. Uh, let's see here. She doesn't ring the bell? Well, I'll send Squish to ring the bell for her. You can ring the bell by proxy. I don't know, brother. You better stay here. I just one Hernandez to ring the bell. I'm risking things, but two, you'd never come back. Uh -uh. Brother, if you want to go out there with your son, you can go out there and ring the bell. Oh, now you don't want to go. I see how it is. Boy, I'll tell you what. Just make up your mind, brother. That's heavy. That's a heavy bell. Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God bless the Amish. Learn something from them. <laughs> the, hey, hey, we can pick on the Amish. They'll never listen to this. <clears throat> They'll never watch YouTube, so we'll get away with it. Anyways, <laughs> I know, well, you know, when you, you, you live in the middle of them, you learn the good things and the bad things. So, so what's the bad things? Getting stuck behind a stinking wagon on a no passing lane going up the hill. Anyways, all right. Hey, I've got a uh, church cleanup list right on the bulletin board. Uh, and if you'd like to sign up for one of the days, I got it for September or October, if you'd like to pick a day. Uh, if you've never cleaned the church before, we'll be glad to walk you through it and show you what needs to be done. It doesn't take much. And it um, doesn't take much. It doesn't take, doesn't take much. So it's easy for you to say you're not the one cleaning the toilets. But anyhow. So, but if you'd like to sign up, or if your family would like to sign up, uh, our family, we're on the list. If you'd like to put your name down, you can just go ahead and do so. And if you need the code to getting into the church, uh, we'll let you have that if you don't know how to get in. Uh, and um, yeah, we will not hold you back from cleaning the church. So just so you know that. All right. Well, I'm excited about what God has for us. It's the fall. It's coming, guys. Can you feel it in the air? This is my favorite time of year. In fact, this is really the best time of the year to be in Payson. It's September, October. Actually, October is the best time of year. And uh, I love this time of year. Man, I love this time of year. Gentlemen, I need to have a meeting with you sometime. And we may have to call for an impromptu men's prayer, break, break, prayer breakfast or maybe a men's prayer supper. I don't know. We'll have to get together. But I need to discuss a few things with you guys in the, in the coming future and maybe in the next couple of weeks. So keep your ear to the ground. Um, there are things I would like to do, but I, I don't want to do it by myself. And I'm going to need to know if I could just get the hand to do it. So uh, there are some activities I'd like to do. But again, same thing. I um, want to know if you'll be here, if you can be a part, and all that stuff. So uh, keep your ear to the ground on that. I'll let you know when we, uh, when we have it, and we'll get together, and uh, we'll talk it out. All right, Brother Miller? You know, it's funny. When we lived in Pennsylvania, all the businesses there in their parking lots had the handicapped parking space, you know. Right next to that was the Amish hitching post. <laughs> and then the regular people could park. And it was kind of wild because when we first moved there, it was like... What's this thing with this little horse with the little ring around the nose, you know? And I realized I saw this Amish guy pulling up with his buggy, and he would tie his reins there. <laughs> it's like, okay, hardworking people, but I would not want to live their lifestyle. My goodness, that's hard. Anyway, so we're going to sing number 50, Be Thou Exalted. Actually, we're doing all songs today by Fanny Crosby, blind leader, uh, blind songwriter, I should say. And it's interesting that at Wheaton College, just a, a year or two ago, they found another box of her works that had not been published yet. So there's a lot of authors that are taking her words now and setting that to music. 
Uh, so we're going to get more of Fanny Crosby here in the, in the next few years with some more hymn books. But anyway, we're going to sing number 50. Let's all stand, please, and you join us. Be thou exalted. and angels be thou exalted with harp and with song saints and their anthems of rapture adore thee thine be the glory forever amen be thou exalted O son of the highest savior of sinful men redeemer and God to the Father, co-equal in glory, humbly we come to Thee, our homage to bring. Be Thou exalted by saints and angels, be Thou exalted with harp and with song, saints and their anthems. Of rapture adore thee, thine be the glory forever, amen. Be thou exalted, O spirit of power, dwelling within our hearts to keep us from sin. God of the ages and Lord of salvation, ruler of heaven and earth. Thy praises we sing. Be thou exalted by saints and angels. Be thou exalted with harp and with song. Saints in their anthems of rapture adore thee. Thine be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. And one more number. 101 all the way my savior leads me but this would be the little different tune there 101 all the of 
his love, perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house. I was thinking about this song, I'm saying everyone in this room, from the youngest to the oldest, we all experience the same thing, and that's sometimes not feeling loved or not thinking that anybody cares. I know as a pastor, and pastors tell the same thing, you can, be, you can sacrifice, you can do things for people, and then you say, well, don't they care? <laughs> uh, we can, young people, quite often they'll say, well, my parents don't care what I'm doing. Little children even, they'll sometimes get discouraged and say just nobody cares what I think because we're so busy. But I want to tell you that I'm going to sing a song, Does Jesus Care? And the answer to that is yes. yes. Amen. <clears throat> Does Jesus care when my heart is pained too deeply for mirth? or song as the burdens press and the cares distress and the way grows weary and long oh yes he cares i know he cares his heart is touched with my grief when the days are weary the long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when my way is dark with a nameless dread and fear? As the daylight fades into deep night shades, does he care enough to be near? Oh yes, he cares, I know he cares. His heart is touched with my grief. When the days are weary and the long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. Does Jesus care when I've tried and failed to resist some temptation fear? When for my deep grief there is no relief, though my tears flow all the night long. Does Jesus care when I've said goodbye to the dearest on earth to me? And my sad heart aches till it nearly breaks. Is it aught to him? Does he care? And the answer to that, oh yes, he cares. I know he cares. The truth is much with my grief. When the days are weary and the long night dreary, I know my Savior cares. I believe the Bible says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you is what the scriptures teach and um, appreciate that song hope to be an encouragement to you Ezra chapter 2 in your Bibles Ezra chapter 2 whoop there we go 
Ezra chapter 2, right after 2 Chronicles chapter 30, actually, right after 2 Chronicles. About to say chapter 36, but actually it's right after chapter 1 of Ezra. Just checking to see if you all are paying attention. Ezra chapter 2, what a wonderful chapter. <laughs> uh, not really. It's a long one, guys. <clears throat> Ezra chapter 2, verse 1. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those which had been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away unto Babylon, and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his city, which came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Sariah, Releah, Liah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispar, Big Bai, Rehum, Baana, the number of the men of the people of Israel, and uh, you guys just help yourself with the rest of those names. <clears throat> just help yourself. All right, so we come to an interesting portion of scripture, and this is one of the two censuses of the people of Israel coming out of Babylon or Babylonian captivity. Uh, they are going back to their homeland as God promised before when they went into captivity. And by the way, this is a very important thought, guys. This is a very important thought. As long as we are here on this earth, there is a chance for freedom for the people of God. All right? And what you're seeing here is the census of Israel coming out of captivity. They were sent into captivity as punishment for their disobedience to God's commands. But as they go into captivity, Jeremiah tells them, after 70 years, you guys are coming back out. In the case of Israel, God's predestined elect, their punishments and captivities will always come to an end eventually. This is promised in Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah, Romans, Revelation, etc., etc. And when it comes to those who have been saved by God's grace because of the Lord Jesus' blood, we are promised spiritual freedom in every situation. Look at John chapter 8 and verse 38. John chapter 8 and verse 38, or excuse me, verse 36. As long as we are on this planet under the sun, there is hope. Sure. All right? There is hope. If you're Israel, there is hope for the nation of Israel. But you have to endure to the end. So what do you mean by that? Well, if you don't survive the Holocaust, you'll not see, 19, you'll not see Israel become a nation. Okay? And if you don't survive the tribulation, then you will not see Christ coming in the clouds uh, to set up a kingdom on this earth. So he that endures to the end, Matthew 24, is going to fit with the nation of Israel. All right? If you're the child of God, you've been saved, in which case you're neither Israel nor Gentile. You're the, you're the, part, you're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are the three categories in the Word of God. If you're a child of God, there is always freedom even in the midst of captivity. Now look at John 8, 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Amen. Do you see that? Right. So Israel coming out of captivity in Ezra chapter 2 reflects God's mercy and grace upon His people. Eventually, the glory of eternal life, which will overshadow all misery in this life, will be realized by his saints. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 19. This is our hope, by the way. Look what the Bible says. This is an amazing verse. If in this life only we have hope in Christ... We are of all men most miserable. Here's what God's saying in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 19. If it all ends in the grave, but you have Christ on this earth, that's miserable. Now, I'm not going to be super spiritual with you. Well, as long as I have Christ, as long as I'm a Christian now, it doesn't matter what happens as long as I live this life uh, for Christ. No, 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 guys. If that's all we get, 
is Christ and then the grave. Paul is honest here. He says that's misery. You want to know why? Because even as a Christian, you will have to deal with the long, dull, dreary, mundane, tedious, and miserable things of life. That's part of life. Now, it is good to be free inside, be free spiritually, and be able to come to Christ even in the worst situation. But I'll tell you something. This isn't it. And I thank God for it. I thank God for it. Go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Because of the resurrection of Christ, we have hope and glory. Take a look at this. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18. If you're there, say amen. amen. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time, and guys, we're going to suffer. You can't live in this life and not suffer. I think we're seeing suffering more today than ever before. Would you all agree with me? Amen. I think we're seeing suffering more. If you're not suffering more, we're seeing suffering more. But suffering is a part of this life, and we can thank Adam and Eve for that. He says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Now, this is all a wonderful promise to those who have been born again. But what do we do with the next 69 verses in Ezra chapter 2? The fact is, in Ezra chapter 2, after verses 1 and 2, yeah, from here on out, it's just a compilation of names that are hard to pronounce, titles, and numbers. And my wife yawns right at that moment. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Now listen, guys, how do we handle this? Now, this chapter is two things right off the bat. Number one, it's still inspired scripture. Yes. So therefore, we need it and should read it and study it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So it's inspired scripture. Zerubbabel, Parash, Pahath, Moab. That's a bummer of a name. Zatu, Zekai, Benai, Bebai, Asgad, Adonikam. Big Vi, that would be made fun of today. You know, see, in those days, in, in, in Israel, they probably wouldn't name. They probably like, you know, they probably thought Big Vi was a cool name. You know, kind of like I remember when I grew up. I thought, I thought Anthony was a little bit long, and Tim was cool. If you were Tim, you were cool. You know, like man, that's a cool name just to be called Tim. That's so I think Big Vi was probably the same thing in Israel. Big Vi, oh, it's Big Vi. He's got the cool name. If he's not cool, at least he's had a cool name. So. All right, you got the Nethanims, this guy's name, the children of Lod. There's Hadad, or Hadid, excuse me. Uh, Senea, Michmas, Rama. Uh, I mean, these are the names, guys. And um, it's inspired scripture. I hate to break it to you, but it's inspired scripture. Right. Number two, the second thing that this is, is boring, long, and tedious. Now, I think you could get some fun out of making everybody take a hand in reading these names out, of, out loud. But let's not pretend to be super spiritual. I believe this book is an inexhaustible treasure. Do I get an amen? Yes, but it sure can be exhausting to find it. There are some things in this book that's just plain exhausting. And yet we are commanded to study. And guess what? Look at Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 12. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 12. I like that God puts these verses in there. Our God understands what kind of people we are. In fact, in Psalms 103, Psalms 103, he actually says that the Lord pities us as a father pities his children because he knows that our flesh is as grass. We are weak, all right? We are prone to distractions. Uh, we are prone to laziness. Um, a passage like this, man, I, I would, you know, I'd be tempted to skip it. I'd be tempted to skip it. Because it's just names and numbers. And some of these names don't connect with other names. They don't always connect in Scripture. 
Here's the thing. I know you'd like to think, well, I'll tell you what, get to Luke chapter 2, and then you go from Luke chapter 2 to Matthew chapter 1. Luke 2 and Matthew chapter 1 are also a boring list of names, and yet you'll find that the two connect and have a very important purpose. You get to 2 Chronicles or 1 Chronicles, guys, and you look at the first seven chapters, and you're going, oh, good night. He begat who and who begat what and so on and so forth and on and on it goes, and it doesn't always connect. So, well, I'm sure we'll find something exciting out of that book. Well, help yourself, man. If you can find it, good for you. But I'm telling you, I don't always find something great and exciting out of it. Don't always. So, man, I thought you were spiritual. Ha, fooled you. Think about this for just a moment, guys. Look at this, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 12. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 12. Look what the Bible says. And further, by these my son be admonished of making many books. There is no end. And much study is a weariness to the flesh. Would you agree with me on that? How many have ever had to study for exams? How many just loved every second of it? Yes, All right. Now, see... If you loved every second of it, you were the kid that we beat up behind the school building. <laughs> we had this game that you can't play nowadays. We've, of course, we've changed the name of it. It was called Smear the Queer. And this is what you did. Basically, you found the wimpiest kid, and then you said, hey, have you ever played Smear the Queer? Basically, we give you the football, and then everybody crushes you. That's how we made men out of ourselves. It's what, that's what it was. You didn't have to necessarily be queer. Queer didn't mean you were a sodomite necessarily. It just means you were weird. I love study. Oh, we have this wonderful game that we play. <clears throat> but anyways, I'm sorry. If I've ruined anything that you thought about our church, I apologize. Moving on. Here's the point, guys. It's inspired scripture, and yet it's boring, long, and tedious. So why would the Lord inspire such a list in the scriptures? I got three reasons. I think I've got three reasons, and hopefully, hopefully, I can encourage you by it. And, and if I don't, and you decide to take a nap, just know you got something out of the services, and don't forget about the offering boxes in the back, all right? Simple as that. But, guys, I think there's three simple reasons why God gives us these long, tedious, hard-to-pronounce names and numbers that don't always add up. Numbers that don't always add up. Okay, so here we go. If you're taking notes, number one, here's the first reason. The first reason why these lists are here is to intrigue and inspire us academically. To intrigue and inspire us academically. Now, listen, this is a passage for the academic. You say, I'm not an academic. Okay, well, then just read it and move on, and maybe God will connect a dot for you some other time. But you cannot get around that God is involved in academia. Some suggest that if we were to go back to the old days in this country, we would never advance scientifically. And that it is the church and religion that's holding back to science. Get your COVID shot and shut up. No, 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 guys. The truth be told, the majority of scientific advancements of the past came from the minds of Bible-believing Christians. From understanding that the planet was a globe, Isaiah chapter 40, to understanding the paths of the sea in Psalms, we will find the hand of God moving us forward academically. In fact, let me show you a verse. Go to Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8 in your Bibles. Proverbs chapter 8. Now, Proverbs chapter 8 is about wisdom. Proverbs chapter 8 is about wisdom. You can see that right in the first verse. Doth not wisdom cry, and understanding put forth her voice? She standeth in the top of high places, by the way, in the places of the gates. She crieth at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. Unto you, O men, I call, and my voice is to the sons of men. O ye simple, understand wisdom. Ye fools, be of an understanding heart. I will speak excellent things, and the opening of my lips shall be right things, for my mouth shall speak truth. So you can see clearly this chapter is about getting wisdom and getting understanding. Now look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. He says, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Do you see that? 
This is what wisdom, this is what the wisdom of God leads us to. It leads us not just to become pastors and missionaries, and it doesn't just lead us to go win souls for Jesus Christ. You ever think that maybe the wisdom of God led the Wright brothers to build an airplane? Do you ever think that it was the wisdom of God that convinced Columbus that this earth was not flat? Although, have you noticed that in our great advancement today in knowledge and understanding, people are starting to believe we're flat again? Anybody notice that? Hey, hey, as far advanced as we've become, have you noticed that the brightest minds as a whole universally all believe that we came from some primordial slime that grew legs and then eventually became a monkey and then became our ancestors? I don't think we're getting smarter. And I don't think we're advancing. We're starting to slow up. We were advancing, but I think we're starting to slow down, guys. Do you realize academically our kids coming out of the social schools of engineering and um, uh, propaganda are dumber than they've ever been? Do you know what the Democrats sacrificed with their push for COVID-19? Remember, their cry has always been, what you people need is a little more education. What was the first thing they sacrificed when COVID hit? Education. They sure did. Now, we already know that what's being taught in 12 years of propaganda is not education these days. But isn't it interesting how they were willing to sacrifice all the kids schooling, even though it was proven that they rarely got the virus? But they didn't care about education because it's never been about education. They have never been about wisdom. They've never been about understanding. Because the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. If you don't have that foundation established, the rest of it's going to fall flat on its face. Come on, guys. Think, think about common sense. Common sense says if you are sick, you stay home. Common sense does not say, listen carefully, Common sense does not say, well, since there's a virus, no one can buy seeds to plant gardens. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Common sense does not say, yes, you can go to the ball game and cram yourselves in, but we cannot take cash. Think about that. How, how, why are we supposed to accept every word they say when none of it makes sense? Sure. You need to get the virus, or you need to get the vaccine. If you get the vaccine, then you don't have to wear the mask. All right, I got the vaccine. Guess what? You have to wear the mask. Why? Because the vaccine doesn't protect you from the virus. So the mask protects me from the virus? Yeah, you have to wear the mask, but you've got to get the vaccine because the mask doesn't protect you from the virus. You say, well, that didn't make sense. Of course it doesn't make sense, and yet that's exactly what they're saying. And these are the most educated of our country? Come on now. What this chapter does is intrigue us academically, guys. Look at Proverbs 8 again. It says, I find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way, and the forward mouth do I hate. Here's the thing, guys. After the fear of the Lord is established, we also must establish what you must hate. Have you noticed that society is absolutely against hate? They think you cannot hate. How does that make sense, guys? You have to hate something. Don't you hate pride? Don't you hate arrogancy? Well, no. We hate anybody who hates. Right. I follow you. He said, the forward mouth do I hate. So after the fear of the Lord is established and hate for the right things, notice how the sound mind comes into play. Look at verse 14. Counsel is mine and sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. Here's what psychology says today. Are you having a bad day? Yes. It's because your mother frowned at you when you were a child. No, you idiot. It's because you're having a bad day. It's as simple as that. Well, yeah. you were not loved as a child. You were not loved as a child. Let me tell you something. God has loved you the moment you came into this world. He loved you before you were even born. Amen. 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 Didn't somebody tell you that? Never forget that. But the problem is, is you, just, you, you, you don't know how to express yourself. They, this child, he's wanting to kill his mother because he's trying to express himself. He's just crying out. No, he's got murder in his heart. That's the problem. Well, we got to find the, the, the source of the murder. I hate to break it to you, but it's much simpler than you think. It's called born in sin. Born in sin. 
And the answer is Christ. But he says, counsel is mine, sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. By me, kings reign. This is wisdom. And princes decree justice. By me, princes rule and nobles. Even all the judges of the earth, I love them that love me, is what God says. And those that seek me early shall find me. So let's look at the academic part of Ezra chapter 2. Now this is interesting, guys. I, I'll, I'll be cursory on this. I, we can't go deep. You can do the study on your own if you like. And the first thing we need to know about this academically is that the names matter. The names do matter. Now, in verse 2, it says, uh, in verse 2, it says, it, it is, describes the leadership that leads Israel into Jerusalem, which came with Zerubbabel. Now, if you look at Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, you'll find that Zerubbabel was the governor appointed to lead Israel, all right? Then Jeshua, you say, who's Jeshua? Well, Haggai chapter 1 verse 1 also reveals that Jeshua was the high priest, or Joshua was the high priest. Then we have Nehemiah. Now, what we don't know is whether this is the same Nehemiah that authored the book Nehemiah. We don't know that, guys, because uh, if it is, we know that he had to go back to uh, Persia and serve the king. Is it possible? Could be. Then there's Sariah, Realiah, Mordecai. Is this the same Mordecai that served uh, um, Ahasuerus in the book of Esther? Again, could be, but we don't know that for certain because he also will be back in uh, the, the land of Persia. But we have Mizpar, Big Vi, Rehum, and Baana, the number of the men of the people of Israel. So we've got the leadership that will be in charge of this great caravan that will be listed uh, in the next 68 verses. All right, in verse 2, we see that, or excuse me, in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, we see an explanation to who are the main leaders, all right? So names do matter, but then you say, what about the rest of the names? Well, the rest of the names matter to God. Does that make sense? Sure. And that's why they're there. We may not understand why they matter to God until we see God in the blessed hope, or if we kick the bucket and God takes us home in the presence of the Lord, we can say, God, why would you put all these names there, and why do they matter? And since you'll have all eternity to be with God, I'm sure that's what it will take to explain why all these names are here. But we don't lose any sleep over the fact that we don't know every name or the connection with every name. One thing is interesting, though, and that is this. Names do matter to God, and God knows you by name if you're his child in John chapter 10. And if your name is not found written in the book of life, guys, you're cast into the lake of fire forever. So names do matter. Amen. Even if you don't understand all that is found in Ezra chapter 2. The second thing is numbers matter. Now here's where it gets interesting. The sister passage to this uh, is Nehemiah chapter 7. <coughs> Basically, in Nehemiah chapter 7, you have an exact replica, sort of, to Ezra chapter 2. Now when you compare the two censuses, you will find many, you ready for it, discrepancies. Now, those who are always trying to prove that there is no perfect final authority love to point this out. The problem with these discrepancies between Nehemiah chapter 7 and Ezra chapter 2 is that they are vast. They are vast. In fact, let me give you an example. Um, <clears throat> Let's, you guys stay in Ezra chapter 2, or if you want, you can follow along in Nehemiah chapter 7. I'll go to Nehemiah chapter 7, all right? I'll go to Nehemiah chapter 7. You're in Ezra chapter 2. And let's, uh, let's start. You look, you look at Ezra chapter 2 and verse 3, and I'll read Nehemiah chapter 7, and we'll look at verse, um, <clears throat> I'll look at verse 7. Uh, actually, I'll look at verse 8. All right, so you're in Ezra chapter 2 and verse 3. Here's what Nehemiah chapter 7 and verse 8 says. The children of Parash, is that what your Bible says in Ezra chapter 2? Right. All right, the children of Parash, 2,170 and 2. 2,172, is that what your Bible has? Right. Okay, good. All right, verse 9, uh, or excuse me, verse 4 for you guys. The children of Shephatiah, 370 and 2. 372. Is that what you guys got? Right. All right, good. Uh, the children of Ara, 650 and 2. 652. Is that what you guys have? 
All right. So we have our first discrepancy. Now you say, well, well uh, how are these two connected? Look at verse, um, you guys look at verse 2. Let me read verse 7. This shows us that these are the same censuses. All right? I'm going to read verse 7 of Nehemiah chapter 7. Who came with Zerubbabel, Jeshua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Rehemiah, Nehemiah, Mordecai, Bilshan, Mispareth, Bigvi, Nehun, Benaiah. The number, I say, of the men of the people of Israel was this. All right? Does that sound familiar? It sounds familiar. Okay, so this is the same census, but we don't get but three verses in, and we already have a discrepancy. And your discrepancy is this. In verse 5 of Ezra 2, the children of Era, 770 and 5. And Nehemiah 7, verse 10, the children of Era, 650 and 2. So we've got a, we got to, while well, you do the math. Okay, I don't have my calculator here, so I'm not going to go ahead and do it for you. Now, this is quite a difference. Let's continue. You're going to look at verse 6. Ezra 2 and verse 6. And I am going to look at verse um, 11. Okay, you're in verse 6. I'm in verse 11. The children of Pehath, Moab, of the children of Jeshua and Joab, 2,818. 2,818. What do you have? 12. 212. Okay, we have another difference. We have another difference, all right? Um, let's go on to the next one. The children of Elam, 1,254. 1, 2, 5, 4. What do you guys have? Say it again. Same thing, okay. The children of Zatu, are we on the same one? Yes. Z-A-T-T-U, all right, 840 and 5, 845, what do you guys have? Nine. Nine, okay. Let's look at children of Zakai, 703 score, that would be 760, what do you have? 760, okay. The children of Binui, 640 and 8, 648, what do you have? Two. 642, okay. So basically, guys, Ezra's total census is going to be 29,818 named. And it's going to contain 494 people not listed in Nehemiah's census. Nehemiah's total census will be 31,089 named, containing people not listed, uh, and also containing people not listed in Ezra's census. Now, here's where it gets really interesting. Those are the total numbers if you add them up, all right, that are named and listed. But look at Ezra 2 and verse 64. Here is the absolute total. And I'm going to read Ezra or Nehemiah 7 and verse 66. Y'all there? All right. It says, you should be reading the whole congregation together. Is that what you got? Right. All right. Was 40 and 2,303 score. Right. Is that what you have? So here's what gets interesting. So in Ezra's total census, we have 29,818 named. and Nehemiah's, we have 31,000 named. But the total, when they final the total, that's those that are named and those that are unnamed, they both come to the same number. Say, so how's that work out? Now, isn't that interesting? Now, listen, guys, I don't like math. Brother Bullock likes math. I don't like math. But this intrigues me. So the, immediately the textual critic says, oh, there's discrepancies. We've got a problem. Yeah, but they all ended the same number. Now we know, guys, and here's really the easy answer. The easy answer is this. What they listed was named, and the total includes both named and unnamed. Now you are a friend of the Word of God, not a critic of the Word of God. So therefore, that is the answer. It is not that they failed in the census. Now, I want you to think about it. We have two different censuses, all right? Two different censuses about the same group of people, except for, remember, they leave from Babylon. And in the process of leaving from Babylon, God told them that they not only get to inhabit Jerusalem, but they get to inhabit the cities up to Jerusalem. They get to get the land back. So you've got this group of people that's not only going to march through Gentile land, but they are going to march through Israel land as well. How many of them turned away? How many of them said, you know what, I'm going to stay here in Arvad. I'm going to stay here in New York City. Well, that would be a little bit impossible, I think. You never know. I mean, if they had the ships and all that, Star Trek, beam me up, beam me over. Who knows? But here's the point, guys. How many women had children on the way? How many people died on the way? Think about this. Things change from one point to the other. What's cool is they still came to the same total. Say, what's the discrepancy? There is none. There is none. Two different censuses done 10 years apart. 
and in the process, you've got a pretty cool math lesson. And you've got something to encourage you to trust in the Lord. His word is always right. Details must be taken into account. And yet the totals remain the same. The answer is simple. Here's something else. When you get to the end, when you get to the end, guys, of Nehemiah chapter 7, it gives a list of the gold and silver that is given. Now, because some of you are cheap, and Abraham Lincoln begs for mercy when he comes into your presence, you will immediately wonder, how is it we have 6,000, was it shekels or grams, I can't remember, of gold in Ezra chapter 2, and by the time we get to Nehemiah's census, there's only 1,000 talents of gold. Now, some of you are like, somebody's been skimming off the top. They had to have been Baptists. You know that's what's going on. Somebody's stealing money. But actually, if you read the end, it shows how much Nehemiah gave individually, whereas in Ezra, it shows what all the chief fathers gave collectively. It's a matter of details. Paying attention to the details, you'll find that God's word is always true. There is no discrepancy. Amen? And you can trust this book. Amen. It ought to intrigue you academically. Make your kids do the math on this. They might find that I got the numbers incorrect. And by the way, ask Rex. It's not hard for me to get uh, a number incorrect. Start, he, look, when you've got like 300 things that you have to put into an electrical job, it's easy to miss one connector. I mean, Rex is like, you ought not to miss one connector. <laughs> fortunately, fortunately, God doesn't miss a thing. Rex is like, well, why doesn't that help my prophet? <clears throat> because you're stuck with me and not God. I'm sorry. Here's the thing we need to understand, guys. The fact that the total stays the same is incredible, incredible to me, and yet not really when you consider God. Instead of chalking it up to God's inability to keep good records, chalk it up to man's predictability to change. Think of it this way. Malachi 3.6, for I am the Lord... I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Is that not cool? If our life hinges on the actions of men, guys, we're dead men. But since our life hinges on the mercy of an unchangeable God, we are not consumed. And to God be the glory. All right, so there you go. Number one, to intrigue us, and inspire us academically. Number two, to remind us that he is involved in the common things of life. Now look at Nehemiah chapter 7, verse 5. Nehemiah chapter 7 and verse 5. Nehemiah 7 and verse 5. Look at this in verse 5. And this gives you kind of a glimpse into why Ezra, or excuse me, Zerubbabel would have taken the census. It could have been Zerubbabel, it could have been another writer. I don't assume that it's Ezra, but look at this, Nehemiah chapter 7, 7 and verse 5. If you're there, say amen. amen. The Bible says, And my God put into mine heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them which came up at the first and found written therein. So what Nehemiah reveals right off the bat is that God put it in his heart to take this census, just like he put it in the heart of the writers of Ezra and First Chronicles and Matthew and Luke chapter 2 to write these genealogies down. What it shows us is that God is involved in the boring, mundane, tedious things of life because it is life. The author of the Bible is the author of human life. And if you think that life doesn't have its boring, dull, tedious, dreary, repetitive hours, days, and sometimes months, you're pretending. It isn't always excitement. It isn't always an adventure. Some days it's just sitting in front of the computer manipulating numbers. Sometimes it's drawing lines on a board. Sometimes it's just nailing nails and doing the same repetitive process. And God is right smack in the middle of it all because it's human life. You know what this reveals? It reveals exactly what Brother Bullock's saying, that God cares When you're bored out of your skull, God cares. And this should encourage us in this life when all the emphasis is on entertainment and fear 
Is that not true? This is why Hollywood puts out two things, entertainment and horror. If we can't laugh you silly, if we can't excite you with adventure, we'll scare the snot out of you. And the Democrats know exactly that that's what you ought to do. And so they've done it with COVID-19. Look at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. This is one of the coolest passages in the Word of God. I love this. Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. 12. Look at verse 4. If you're there, say amen. amen. All right. It says, I say unto you, my friends. I like that Jesus refers to us as his friends. And I neat. He says, I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that, they have no more that they can do. Right. And I like that God puts that in there. Look, if they put this vaccine mandate, and then they, they say, all right, you won't take it. We'll fine you. Well, fine, fine me. I won't pay it. All right, then we'll throw you in jail. Fine, throw me in jail. I'll start a jail ministry. All right, then we'll kill you. Yeah, that's all you can do. That's it. That's all you can do. Now, you might prolong it, and we hope that you won't. But the fact is, that's all that they can do. And that matters. So, well, I don't know. Going through that valley of the shadow of death, you know, that's a pretty scary thing. Not to the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, be not afraid. He said, be not, did you see that? Be not afraid of them that can kill the body. And after that, have no more that they can do. You think of these Muslims that are hacking people up and Christians up over there in Afghanistan because of the bungling of our leaders. Let me tell you something. That's all that they can do. Right. That's it. You imagine after going into a church and killing every Christian that's in there, you see the guy heaving and breathing with his machete dripping with blood or his AK smoking, and he realized, what else do I got? Nothing. You got nothing, man. You did nothing. You just took the life of those that love Jesus Christ. You just hastened the day where they could be absent from the body and present right. with the Lord. You've got nothing left to do. Well, I'll just rule everybody's life. And for how long and how will that satisfy? It never satisfies. It never satisfies, guys. That's why they keep going back to the excitement and, and the thrills of drugs. And you look at these child stars that, that grew up and I was, we were, uh, how many, anybody remember, I'm going to go pop culture, ready? Anybody remember the show Different Strokes? What you talking about, Willis? Anybody remember that? That just woke up about 10 of you, okay? The rest of you are like, I was not born prior to 1978, all right? But anyway, that show, I started reading about the actors. Gary Coleman was that cute little black kid. You know what, he had, his life was misery galore. He made $19 million off that show. Back then, that's a lot of money. $19 million he made out of it. You know what his life was? Misery till he died in, in, at 42 years old of age. The daughter of the show, she went into pornography and ungodliness and drugs. Misery. Misery. You know what's interesting? Willis, now this is interesting. Willis, the one that he's, what you talking about? Okay, Willis, he went into drugs. All these guys, he made tons of money on the show. He went into drugs, messed up his life. You know what happened to him? He got saved. Did you know that? He got saved. You know, this day he's still preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Now that's cool. Yeah. His show, pfft, cheap entertainment. But what he's doing now, well, now he's making a difference. He'll save you. You wreck your life, he'll save you. Amen? But you know why they go into the drugs? You know why they go into the pornography? Because their life is boring. It's dull. I look at that kid. I don't remember his name. Vince... Uh, is it Todd Vince, I think it is? He's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. God said this, don't you dare call common what I have cleansed. Sure. Amen. Amen, guys. Now look at this, verse 5, Luke chapter 12. But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Now, I mean, if you're going to be scared of somebody, be scared of somebody that has control of your eternal soul, right? right. Yeah, I say unto you, fear him. Now watch this. After he establishes who you should fear, then he changes gears here, or does he? He says, are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. How many heard a sparrow, sparrow singing this morning? Some of you probably didn't, didn't even remember. You don't think about a sparrow. And God says, not one is forgotten. Not one. How beautiful is a sparrow? Usually they're kind of a grayish brown. Not, there's nothing spectacular. You think of a cardinal, a cardinal is bright red, right? Or you think of a blue jay uh, or a stellar jay in Arizona. There are a little bit louder than Michigan jays. 
Um, but they're still annoying. And they're blue. You have parrots, all this beautiful. But you think of a, a sparrow. The reason why Jesus Christ brings up a sparrow because they were the dullest birds back then. And nobody thinks twice. And he says, listen, he, he points out two things. He, he points out a mundane animal and the price that it would be sold for. Two farthings. Who even cares of something that costs two farthings? That's, that didn't cost anything. Nobody would even give it a second glance. And God says, not one sparrow is forgotten. And then he says something even more boring. He's, well, for some. He says, but even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Now, guys, that would be the most boring job in the world. If you had to count, some, some of you would be a very short job. But uh, it would be the most boring job in the world to have to keep count of how much hair is on top of your head. God pays attention to that kind of thing. Why? What in the world? Who cares? God cares. Guys, God cares. It, guys, listen. A sparrow, your hair, they're not making a difference in the grand scheme of life. But the decisions you make for your family and for your business and for others around you. Now, if he cares about a sparrow, don't you think he pays even more attention to that? Sure. And that's what Jesus is trying to drive home. Be careful about the fun crowd who always have to have something to entertain them. Guys, they will sacrifice truth and faithfulness in order to pay to play. Are you listening to me? That's exactly what in Exodus 32 Israel did. Moses was gone for 40 days and 40 nights, and they said, you know what? Let's get us a better God. And this time, when we worship this God, we're going to have a band, and we're going to have playtime, and we're going to have family fun night, and we're going to have a party. Not unlike, you know, the typical Israel religion. They're just as boring as all get out. By the way, our churches get full of them, and most of the fun crowd either will not be faithful to church or they'll be gone within about six days. Six to seven years. And they'll, they'll gravitate to the baby Christians and they'll convince the baby Christians that if you're not having a party every single day and you're not having fun and fellowshipping every single day and you're not out playing games, that the church has died. That is not how it works, guys. God is smack in the middle of getting up in the morning, reading your Bible, praying, and then going back to work. And working eight, ten hours, and then coming back home, dead tired, and feeding your family, and loving your family, going back to bed, and then getting back up again, reading your Bible, talk to the Lord for a few minutes, and go right back to work for eight to ten hours, then turn around and come back home, and go to bed, and then get back up the next morning, and go back to work, and back home to bed, and back to work, and show up for church on Wednesday, and show up for church on Sunday, and then back to work, and back to work, and back to work, and back to work, till you'd have no more energy to work, and you retire, and then you die and you think, what have I done? If you served God faithfully, God paid attention every second of Amen. it. He wasn't looking at, well, how much entertainment did you bring to the church? How much zeal and spirit did you fire the people up? Hey, let's go on over to the Miller's house. It's a party time there. You just got to go over to their house. I mean, they got everything working. They got the backyard and the lights and the LEDs and, and the, 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 the little flowers and the neighbor's dog barking in the background. I mean, the apple trees and they got everything. A greenhouse that if you sit in it, you'll roast. Man, if we don't have that, we'll never make it. Amen. You know what? You don't always go over their house. You don't always go over my house. You don't always go out and play every day. You know what? It's just getting up and going to work sometimes. Right. And God's right in the middle of all that. Amen. And he's working in the middle of all that. God cares. Yes, sir. God cares. Acts chapter 10, verse 13. Acts chapter 10, verse 13. Peter sees a vision. He sees a vision. Acts 10 and verse 13. Peter sees a vision. A sheet comes down with all these unclean animals. And Peter, and Peter hears this voice. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. There's everything. There's a snake. There's a centipede. There's a, there's a pig. There's a, there's a giraffe in there. I don't know. Maybe a giraffe. It'd be kind of big to put in there. But it's a vision, so anything could happen. A purple elephant for all I know. And here's what Peter says, Not so, Lord, in Acts 10, verse 14, For I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice spoke unto him again the second time. Spake unto him the second time, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. 
When God cleanses a thing, guys, you're not just a common thing. You're a child of God. You're a child of God. Number three, here's my last point, and I know, I know I've taken your time. Number three, here's my last reason for why Ezra 2, verses 1 through 70. It is to introduce to us the importance of Christ. I said, what? Christ is not found in chapter 2 of the book of Ezra. He's not found there. It's 70 verses of names and numbers. There's camels, there's goats, there's, there's asses, there's, there's weird names, there's gold, there's silver. There's no Christ. No, 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 you missed it. Look at verse 1. Ezra 2 and verse 1. Now these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those that have been carried away, whom Nebuchadnezzar the king of Babylon hath carried away unto Babylon and came again unto Jerusalem and Judah, every one unto his people. City. I want you to think, what did I say? City, excuse me, city. I want you to think about this for just a moment. Were there other cities besides Jerusalem? Yes. Would you say there were other genealogies besides Israel's? No. Why, why not? There were... We were talking about Gog and Magog. Those people existed. There's, 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 there's the Arabic people. There's, you know, there's the Indian, the Indian and Asian people. Uh, the continents are separated, guys. North America still existed, and the indigenous people existed back then. The South American people existed back then. There are all kinds of genealogies. There's all kinds of lists. Why don't we see their names? What about the Italians in Italy? What about Rome? What about the, the Greek leaders like Alexander the Great? And, and what about the names of Caesar? And how come when we read about these pharaohs, we don't get their first names? Why Israel? Of all the people, why? I want to show you something. Look at Ezekiel chapter 20. Ezekiel chapter 20. This, this really stood out to me. I just, I'm almost done reading the book of Ezekiel in my devotions. Ezekiel, about like four chapters left. Ezekiel chapter 20, though. Look at this. Ezekiel 20, verse 15. Yet also I lifted up my head unto them in the wilderness. If you're there, say amen. amen. Okay? Yet also I lifted up my head or hand unto them in the wilderness, that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all lands. Guys, milk and honey, that's not your cereal. That's, that's, that's the promised land. Is it not? You all with me? That's Israel. And he says, it is the glory of all lands. The Middle East, the glory of all lands. Couldn't you think of any place better than the Middle East? Think about that. Guys, I can think of places. Look, Israel, I want to go there. But the only reason why I want to go there is because that's where Jesus walked. I'd like to see it. Yeah. But I have seen the pictures of Israel. It's a dry, dusty, desert land. Payson looks prettier than that. I know Israel has their pretty places. But I'm going to tell you something, guys. I can think of, I can, well, how about the Rockies? The Rockies are pretty, guys. How about let's get up in the Montana? Let's go to Alaska. Let's, let's go to Europe and let's look at, uh, let's, let's look at the Alps and, and, and Austria. How about Austria or Switzerland? Man, if I'm going to think of the glory of all lands, not California. If I'm going to think of the glory of all lands, I'm not going to think of Israel. And God says it is the glory of all lands. I say what? Why is that? You know what God's saying? He's saying you're looking at it all the wrong way. The answer is God considers his son more important than anything else. More important than social justice. More important than peace on earth. More important than women's independence. Landscapes, mountains, geography, children. Guys, his son is more important than even your salvation. Well, I thought it was sent because of our salvation. It is, and it's because he loves you. But I'll tell you something, his son ranks higher than that. You say, well, what does that have to do with the glory of all lands, guys? Think about it. Everywhere his son walks, well, since his son is so important, whatever his son intersects with, that's going to be important to him. Do you follow me? Sure. say, well, I, I, doesn't God mention Egypt? Yeah, that's because his son went into Egypt and came out. Right. Egypt just got lucky. You follow me? What about all these other things? Listen, his son and his people, Israel, intersect with those folks and because of that they get put into the scriptures but North America doesn't get put into the scriptures you want to know why because they never landed here 
right? Bethlehem gets a specific mention in Scripture. Why? Because his son was born there. Think about that for just a moment. Jerusalem gets a special mention in Scripture because his son will reign there, and he has walked there. And that shows that God thinks his son is important. That's why he mentions these lists. That's why he mentions these names. Because all of these names, all of these lists point to the Lord Jesus Christ. Out of Israel comes a scepter, Judah in particular. Out of Jacob comes the king of glory. Philippians chapter 2 says this, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus. Guys, you can't tell me Jesus isn't more important to God over everything. That at the name of Jesus every name shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, God the Father. Bethlehem is where he was born. Jerusalem is where he be sacrificed. No wonder Jerusalem is so important to God. His precious son was killed there. That's where he was buried, and that's where he rose again, and that's where he's coming back, guys. Jerusalem is the one place on earth where peace can come because of Christ's presence. Luke chapter 2, 14. Haggai chapter 2, verse 9. Psalm 76, verse 3. The Jews are connected with Christ. Therefore, the focus of the book is on them, and Christ comes to them first and to them last. Is it not true? Look at John chapter 1, verse 49. John chapter 1 and verse 49. You know why the world hates Israel? Because Christ went to them first. God chose them first, and they hate that. They're jealous. Look, man, we got grafted in. Thank God for it. Thank God that he has brought the gospel to us. He went to the Jew first, then he went to us. Thank God we get in on that. And we have no illusions that somehow we take rank over them. We don't. Now look at this. John chapter 1 verse 49. Nathanael answered and saith unto him, Rabbi, he's talking to Jesus Christ, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. You know, Pilate nailed it. Hey, listen, Pilate wouldn't even get a blip in the scriptures if it didn't, if Jesus Christ hadn't stood in front of him. Do you understand? Nobody would know about Pilate. Nobody care about his name. He only got lucky. He got put into history. Otherwise, no one would ever remember him. It's because Christ crossed his path. Herod, Christ crossed his path. Think about that for just a moment. This isn't just about Israel. It's about the importance of God's son in the eyes of God. And that's why he puts their genealogy down and not yours. Anyone connected with his son will get noticed in the grand scheme of life. You ever notice how we don't get a glimpse into the great rulers of the world unless they come into contact with Christ or his people? Guys, listen to this. Colossians 2 and verse 2 and 3. This is important. That their hearts might be comforted being knit together. You know what? We better read these verses. We'll close with these two verses. We won't go anywhere else in the scripture. Let's look at these two verses. Colossians 2, verses 2 and 3. You ever hear, you ever hear revolutionists talk about the missing link? Right. right? They've tried to come up with the idea, where's that missing link? Where's that connection between man and beast? Where is that connection? Here's a missing link here, guys. Ready? Colossians 2 and verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ. Watch this now. He ends it with, and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now we started with God wanting to intrigue and inspire us academically. And we end with how that's even possible. In Christ are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want to get further ahead academically? You've got to start with Christ. That's the link, guys. That's the link. Without Christ as your Savior, 
you've missed it all. All you have to do is repent of your dead works and turn to Jesus Christ who has paid the price for all of your sins. That's for salvation. If we're going to grow in Christ, we've got to understand the importance of academics. We've got to understand that God cares in the common, bore, boring, and dull things of life. And thirdly, we've got to understand the importance of Christ, not in our eyes, but in the eyes of God. God's Son is more important than your problems. God's Son is more important than your paycheck. He's more important than your feelings. You follow me? And yet, with all of that said, as important as he is, oh, yes, he cares. I know he cares. Now, why would someone so elevated care about us? Think about that. That's because he loves us. Let's all stand.